ahead and get started because we do have a lot of information we want to cover, a lot of screen sharing and, and whatnot. And um, so I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Jennifer Morgan. I'm the Hunter Education Coordinator for the department out of the Albuquerque office. Um, thanks for joining us on the second Lady Social Hour of 2022. Um, we appreciate all the new folks that are coming on for sure. And for those of you who have been more of our veteran social hour participants um, through all of this, so welcome everybody. Um, I'll go ahead and let the rest of the department staff introduce themselves. Um, I'll pass it off to Tristana, who's to my left. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Tristana Bickford. I'm the department's communications director based out of Santa Fe. And I'm very glad to have everyone here tonight. And hopefully we can answer some questions about applying for the draw and um, anything else that you may be wondering. Okay, uh, Colleen, since you're over to my other side. <laughs> my name is Colleen Payne. I'm a public information specialist for the Department of Game and Fish out of the Southwest area. Um, I did lose my voice this weekend at a hunting convention, so please be patient with me tonight. I got lots of cough drops and water here, so I'll be able, I was talking New Mexico hunting all weekend and looking forward to talking it again uh, here with you ladies this evening. So um, looking forward to our chat. We've got a lot of information to go over, so we're gonna kind of crank through that, but ask questions as we go to, um, and then I believe we also have Megan on the call as well. Hi everybody, my name is Megan Otero. I'm the assistant coordinator for Hunter Education. Um, I'm based out of our Albuquerque office and um, thank you for joining us this evening. Great, uh, Colleen, if you're ready, I can go ahead and uh, I'll put up the PowerPoint. Yeah, let's go ahead and start. Okay, we'll jump right into it. <clears throat> Okay, so thumbs up if everybody can see that. Super. Of course, through uh, during this social hour, um, it's primarily going to be Colleen and myself um, collaborating on this conversation. But I always encourage um, the rest of the ladies, uh, Tristana and Megan, to to chime in if there's happened to be something that uh, you guys want to interject or we haven't covered. Um, and then they can also be monitor, monitoring the chat. Um, so if anybody uh, has questions or needs for us to clarify something, please jump in. Um, this may seem formal, but we definitely want this to be a, a nice casual conversation because uh, we are here to answer your questions about the draw because sometimes it can feel a little intimidating if you've never done it before. And so we're gonna give you some, some background information on uh, how to apply, um, possibly, you know, walk you through it, um, give you some pointers. Um, we've had some questions prior to our social hour about, you know, the odds, you know, where are my chances of drawing the best, but we're going to ask some questions for you guys to ask yourselves um, on the next slide. And um, come on. there we go. Um, oh, well, We'll talk about how the draw works, and then um, we'll, we'll have you guys then internally ask yourself some of those questions um, so it can better help you and help us determine um, maybe what your needs are and your desires um, out of the hunt that you want to. So Colleen, I'll go ahead and, and throw, throw it to you for this particular slide. Awesome. So a lot of questions that we get from the public, whether you have hunted in New Mexico or not, um, is just how the draw even works. Because every state is a little bit different. Um, New Mexico is very unique in the sense that uh, we do not have a point system here in New Mexico. So you do not have to have any preference points. It is pure random draw. Um, so we have uh, you know, luck of the draw on this one and it, it really is that. So. Our draw system is based off of a quota system, um, which means there is preference given to residents. 84% of CAGs per hunt code minimum going to residents, 10% to an outfitter pool, which means you can be a resident or a non-resident to apply in that pool, um, but you must have a signed contract in place at the time of application. And we can talk a little bit about those later too. Um, and then the remaining 6% is available for non-residents. 
So you can see just based off of those percentages that our system here heavily favors resident draw odds. Um, so it's really good to kind of understand that when you're looking at the amount of tags that are available uh, for different species in different areas, different times of year, different weapon types, those all change the amount of tags that could be available. Um, I will say, you know, as we're going through this tonight, if you ladies get a chance, if you have already picked up a paper proclamation or a rules and information booklet at our area offices, or if you've downloaded a digital copy of it to your computer, you can kind of follow along with us tonight and kind of flip through it. There's questions that you have about stuff you can ask us, but this is like our Bible <laughs> for hunting season um, that we live off of. Um, all the information that you need for hunting season is available in that booklet um, and is a really good reference point and place to start. So always refer to that. Um, so just so you know, once you do apply in the draw, say you've selected your hunts, which we're going to show you how to do this evening. Um, once the application uh, process has closed, your applications are assigned a random number. Then the system will uh, randomly draw your application numbers. So you obviously want to be higher up in the sequence than lower because they're going to pull your application. They're going to look and see what your your hunt choices are. If there are hunts available for your first choice, you'll get a license for that hunt choice. If it is the second, if there isn't any left in the first, it'll go to the second. If there's not any in the second, it'll go to the third. If there's no hunts that are left when they draw your application, then unfortunately you don't get a tag. So um, that's why it's kind of good to make sure you know how that works ahead of time and make sure that you're applying for some of those licenses that maybe have more in them. Um, we're going to have, you know, in the next slide here, some really good questions to ask yourself before selecting those hunt codes and maybe what you want to do for the year. But, um, and we'll talk about draw odds later too. Um, there is fourth choice and population management hunts that are also available for selection when you're doing your first, second, and third choices. We'll talk a little bit of those once we show you uh, how to do the application, but just know that they may not be the top uh, hunts that might be available. Fourth choice is by selecting a quadrant in the state. These are usually available only for certain species. Um, and if there's a tag that's left over that wasn't ran through the first draw, uh, you may get it in a fourth choice. For instance, I got a, I drew a fourth choice tag this last hunting season. Um, I didn't end up actually going on the hunt just due to schedule conflicts, but I got a tag um, and I got an opportunity to go out, which was um, always an option. But if you're not interested in the, um, you're not you're more maybe interested in a spe very specific hunt or very um, specific area, you may not wanna choose that fourth choice option. Um, there is no preference that is given to anyone who did not draw a tag last year. I wish that was the case. It would help a lot of people out, but it is your random draw. Um, draw Harp reports, just a reminder, are due today. If any of you ladies drew a big game hunting license last year, you do need to get that harvest report submitted. If you do not, you will be uh, charged with an $8 late fee. And if you still do not do them um, and don't pay that late fee, you could be kicked out of the draw. So it's very important to get those in. That way you can ensure you have an opportunity to apply for hunts next year. And Colleen, I want to interject on that one real quick because um, I think a few of our ladies uh, have javelina tags. So if you still have an open tag, or javelina, oryx, or a barbary sheep, um, you do not have to submit those harvest reports yet because your tag is still open and viable, but you do need to get that in once the license closes. Um, so just be aware of that, that you don't have to freak out if you're a license holder right now for something that you haven't filled. Um, obviously you can't go in and do an accurate harvest report if you haven't actually gone out there uh, to hunt. But if you already have hunted those species that I mentioned, um, and your tag is filled, go ahead and, and report that. So you, then you don't forget. So. Absolutely, good reminder. We do have two different um, harvest report deadlines just because we have some hunts that are still going on right now and some that haven't even started yet. So 
we still kind of give those species and those specific hunts some leeway and a different deadline. Yeah, and Tristan, um, I'll put that link uh, for your harvest report uh, on your customer account. So. Absolutely. So that's kind of a little bit of how the draw works. Um, you know, two things that I kind of have on this slide as well is um, there are ways to get kicked out of the draw. One of them is not doing the hard work. One of them is not having your child support payments up to um, current status. Um, and anyone who has a, a felony also cannot apply for any of the any legal weapon hunts or the rifle hunts um, just because of those firearm possession laws in the state. So just something to consider um, as, as you're selecting hunts and looking at what you want to do for the year. So there is um, some of those things that I was talking about of items that you personally need to think about um, when you're going to apply uh, for a hunt is obviously the very obvious is why do you want to hunt? Um, is it because you're wanting to take somebody and maybe you're mentoring somebody? Um, are you wanting to uh, fill your freezer? Um, are you just wanting the experience or the adventure? So that's a personal choice that, um, that we all have. And it might be multiple different things, multiple different reasons. So the next thing is, is species that you want to hunt. Uh, maybe this is your very first time ever going afield with somebody or yourself, and you just don't feel that ready for a, a bighorn sheep hunt or an ibex hunt, but you want to give it a whirl. And so um, think about those species that are available um, that might be a little bit lower key for you to start. Um, what type of harvest method do you want to use? Um, that is a rifle, muzzleloader, or bow. I know we have a few uh, bow hunters in our group, so um, maybe maybe you don't want to bow hunt anymore. Maybe you want to try rifle hunting. So think about that harvest method. Where do you want to hunt? A, a couple of folks have emailed us and say, hey, um, I really can't go very far from my home base. Uh, so you know, what are some suggestions for me at, at this point? Um, or it's taking me a long time to get to know a unit really well. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking about exploring different areas and different species. So think about those things um, if you want to hunt with other folks. So if, if obviously, if maybe you want to apply alone, but you know that you're going to be going with other people. Um, so think, think about that. And Colleen and I will talk about how to attach your application to somebody or if somebody's coming with you how they attach that with you, and then how, how much money do you want to spend? Or maybe you want to spend a lot, but your budget is only going to allow you X amount of dollars to apply. So um, these are just some things to be thinking about um, when you actually sit down and, 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 and contemplate all of these things. And um, the link to the downloadable PDF for the electronic version is available there on the screen. And somebody also asked, where can you just pick up a hard copy? Uh, they were not uh, distributed to any of our licensed vendors this year. They can only be obtained through coming to one of our area offices. And Tristana had in the chat put where those area offices are located. So you can pick up a hard copy. Um, I'm still kind of old school and, and like paper, but what I really like is I can download um, the electronic copy to my phone and I can, you know, look at my phone offline as well. Uh, Cause sometimes in my pack, I don't ever want to put this in there, but I got my phone with me always. So I can always pull up that PDF version and have it nice and, and available on my phone downloaded offline. So you can definitely do that. Oops. So this is just the area of uh, game, big game unit management map. Gosh, that was hard for me to say. Um, and there's a smaller version of this in the proclamation or the big game booklet. Um, but this is kind of how the state is broken up into game management units. And you can just look at your location and what units are closest to you if maybe you are limited in um, your outreach as far as where you can go. Um, and then of course, this particular map will show you where's private, um, what tribal lands are, where the forest services, BLM, 
Um, you know, this is White Sands Missile Range where the oryx are. So this, but that isn't how the entire state is broken up into game management units. And this corresponds to those um, units that are in the proclamation for all species of deer and elk. And um, so that's what corresponds, that map corresponds to this. Colleen, is there anything that I missed on that? Um, not anything you missed, but just maybe something I want to add is, Please. you know, there is a lot of country in the state to hunt. And so, you know, kind of looking at these, and obviously there's a lot of different colors on here too, right? And all of those mean different things. So some of these orange areas are going to be tribal lands. Jen Menchow mentioned with Unit 19, it's mostly uh, Department of Defense property or White Sands Missile Range. But you see a lot of the green and um, blue and kind of that yellowish color, that's all public lands. New Mexico has over 22 million acres of public land that's accessible for um, hunting and recreating on. And so just kind of seeing what's available in your backyard or maybe is somewhere that you want to go check out new, just see what their um, land availability is like, what access is like. Looking at this map too, you can see that northeast corner of the state is very white. Um, that means that there's a lot of private land in that area. So it's good to know those things before you maybe apply in some of those areas, because um, it could be either difficult for you to get around um, or you know just trying to get access in some of those areas that you're gonna wanna know, can I even get in there? And if it is mostly private, that's gonna tell me, okay, I need to start communicating and reaching out to some landowners, maybe getting some written permission to be able to hunt those areas too, if I do draw tag. So yeah. just something to kind of think of as you start looking in some of these places. And another thing to consider too is, um, you know, we have over 12 big game species in the state of New Mexico that you can hunt. That doesn't mean that all 12 big game species are in, in every unit. Um, you know, that off range oryx hunt says that it's statewide, but if you find a oryx in unit 2B, um, I think the department would really like to know about it because that's not their typical home range in the state of Mexico. So um, it's it, that's it's very valuable to know some of those areas in which those animals live in those units. Yeah, and especially with pronghorn, I know a lot of ladies have been very very interested in putting in for pronghorn hunts, and so that upper northeast quadrant of the state obviously is a lot more conducive habitat for pronghorn. So that's where the majority of your pronghorn tags are going to be all the way from that I-40 corridor that goes through uh, Vaughn or you know, what I was saying, Moriarty, all the way down into Vaughn at Highway 285 and then all the way back up to the Northeast. Uh, so that's where most of your pronghorn hunts are going to be. So just to keep that in mind. So the next item that was on that list is, do my hunting goals fit into my budget? Um, this is a snippet from this year's uh, proclamation that, and I keep saying that, it's, that's old school. So Big Game Rules and Information Booklet. Um, um, it kind of shows you how long I've been around. Um, but this is kind of how those fees are broken up. And especially um, for Bridget um, and our, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name from California, but you'll be looking at those non-resident license fees, but for your residents, um, this is kind of how it's broken up into the elk, um, whether it's standard or quality, uh, deer, pronghorn, et cetera, those other species. And I know that for the non-residents, it seems to get a little confusing as to, hey, why are these antlerless um, hunts not available to me as a non-resident? Those particular opportunities are strictly for New Mexico residents only, whether it's a general tag or a youth only. Um, those are strictly for New Mexico residents. But if you're a non-resident, there are some there are other hunts available to non-residents, and you the, the non-resident youth can also apply just as long as they're not part of the antler list uh, uh, or uh, in the standard or the quality high demand areas. So. Hey Jen, then, I think that's a, a, maybe a good timing to launch one of our poll questions, uh, which I can do right now. Yeah, um, go ahead if you've got you know, it up. We, it, yeah, it's great to see that we do have some non-residents joining us, but we're curious maybe how many here are residents and non-residents because that might help us give us give you guys a lot more information depending upon what your status is. So. 
you don't mind just hitting that hole for us. And you guys are pretty much figuring it out, but if you're a resident, say yes. If you're a non-resident, say no. <laughs> And we kind of figured the, the bulk of the answers would probably be very resident heavy, so. Yeah, mo mostly non-resident. So it's just good to know. Thanks, guys. Hey, Jen, I don't, we keep talking about resident. Should we tell them what makes them a resident? Because uh, I saw somewhere in the chat, someone said they just moved back. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Megan. Um, so to be considered a resident here in New Mexico, we keep saying, oh, if you're a resident, if you're a non-resident, um, to be considered a resident in New Mexico, you have to have lived in New Mexico for 90 consecutive days. Um, so if it's, you know, you haven't had a chance to start changing any of your information over, you just moved back like a month ago, um, you would not can be considered a resident yet. So um, just keep that in mind. And in and, and our big, big game rules and information booklet, it does talk about our, our requirements uh, as far as what, what is considered a resident. Great. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that. Um, we also have some information about what about refunds if you don't draw. So essentially, it's a non-refundable application fee, which those amounts are up at the top corner. Um, but let's say you just put in for that quality mature bull hunt um, for elk and you were unsuccessful in the draw, then that $90 will be refunded back to your account, whatever card or account that you use to apply. So if you're unsuccessful, you do get your money back, which is nice. That, all, that also means that when you ladies apply for the draw, all of those fees are due up front. Um, yes. So that's what Jen means of if you don't draw, do you get that refund back? And yes, you do minus that $7 fee if you're a resident. Um, so that's why it's important to know if does this fit into my budget right now? Because um, you know, February and March are, you know, just starting to get back into the year. You may still be kind of recovering from Christmas uh, fees and stuff, but it's good to know what your budget might be because not only are you applying for those licenses, but if you draw them, that hopefully that's me you're not going to get back. We're hoping that you, you draw all those licenses, but then there's going to be additional fees on top of that of your gas, if you've got to upgrade your gear, you know, additional expenses to account for to make sure that you can even go on the hunt. Yeah. So that's, those are lots of things to definitely consider. Um, a lot of those hunts like Ibex, Oryx, and Bighorn Sheep are all on our bucket lists. But if you start adding those up sometimes and you really wanted to put in for deer and elk too, because you want to go with a friend, then you might have to kind of figure out what you can and can't do and, and, and adjust as, as necessary because your gear for your mule deer hunt is going to be quite a bit different than your Ibex hunt. So <laughs> keep that in mind. All right, let me go ahead and so now we're going to actually get into how do you actually apply. Um, Colleen, could you throw up that other poll about CIN accounts? I sure will. Um, because that's the very first thing. I think most of us have it, but if you don't, we don't want to assume that you don't. And um, for our non-resident hunters out there, you will also need a customer account to set up with us. Uh, that way uh, you can apply. So this is that's going to be the very first thing that you'll need to have done is creating that um, CIN or that customer account. So you should have a poll up in front of you. So go ahead and answer, do you have a customer account or not? Um, the next thing is if you are creating an account, I don't know why that pulled. I don't know why it's not going through either. I know, that's really odd. There we go. No? Relaunch. Hmm. Okay, maybe. There we there go. There's a, a glitch in the matrix, thanks to Zoom. <laughs> um, so you'll, when you create your account, you're definitely going to want to write down your password. Uh, so keep that handy. Then once you're applying, you're going to need to have, um, if you are gonna apply with other people on the same application, there are some application numbers and some information that you're going to need either to apply with somebody or that you're gonna to need to apply, uh, give to somebody else if they're gonna apply on your application. Uh, the login to the customer account to create one is is right there on the screen and then the most important deadline um, we've already missed the deadline for the spring special entry for deer and bear that's already been in, 
in the past. So Bear and turkey. Bear and turkey. Yeah, so that had already passed, but the next one is for the rest of the begin species, and that's March 16th at 5 p.m. Uh, we can't stress enough to not be in your account at 4.30 trying to make it happen on this day because it's going to be really hard and it will shut off on you at 5 o'clock. So if you're in midstream, you have, you're typing in your credit card number and 5 o'clock hits, it's going to kick you out. So just plan ahead and, and get it done as early as you can. And then we have some other draws that are uh, uh, later on in the year for pheasant and crane. And don't quote me on these dates exactly, but it's sometime in mid-July and mid-August. And Tristana or somebody else, if you actually have those dates, um, please feel free to correct me in the chat. Those were last year's dates, so I'm sure it's shifted a little bit. So it looked like most of you were um, already a customer accounts, which is great. There's a couple of you that did not, um, which we can, as we get logged in, we can kind of show you what you what you need to do to create an account, but it's very, very easy. It's like a four-step process and it walks you through the information that the system requires and then you create a, an account. So um, very easy to do and you will access all of your applications, your licenses, your over-the-counter purchases, hunter education, OHV, harvest reports, everything through this customer portal. Yeah, so real quick, um, I, I can stop my sharing and I'm gonna get back into screen sharing just because of that particular slide was um, referencing our, our proclamation. And so, Come on. Uh, when it talks about uh, uh, the hunt codes, um, the other thing too, before I dive too much into it, as uh, um, it come, sometimes gets forgotten is this important reminders page. So make sure to take a look at page two and it talks about your harvest reporting and such. Then um, there is um, some, um, the important reminders kind of goes on for a few pages. And then the important dates page is right here. So you can add these to your calendar and reminders so you don't miss the application deadlines and your result and your um, deadlines to um, submit your harvest reports. Um, I was trying to find the what's new, but I can't find it. But so not to waste any time, um, I'm going to dive right in so you guys can kind of actually see what it kind of looks like um, when it's asking you for hunt codes. Uh, I always recommend having this handy when you're applying. Um, that way you can reference the exact hunt code. And there is a drop down box that you guys will see. But if you're selecting um, maybe a, a unit eight or unit nine um, deer hunt, it'll give you the method that's there, the dates, uh, your hunt code, the type of hunt it is, how many tags are, are available and what the species is. And this is for antler deer. Okay, so that's what those codes mean. And of course, all these acronyms, they're, there's, <laughs> they're spelled out in the, in the booklet as well. Um, that way, if you're like, I have no idea what that means, it will definitely decipher that for you. You don't need a secret decoder ring um, to figure that out. So that's essentially what it looks like. But what I like to do, because I'm a paper person, is I will look at whatever unit and species and I'll highlight it because a lot of times people will click on the wrong hunt code and then they're successful and they're like wait a minute I didn't apply for that and and we'll show you we'll show you that mistake here in a minute because it is really easy to change on that drop down box um, inadvertently um, I've heard that from a lot of people they're like I have no idea that how to hunt unit 27 you know so um, so just be on, on the lookout for that um, Colleen, anything else on this particular in the rib uh, before I move out of it? Yeah, so this is pretty much going to be one of your starting points, ladies. Um, you're going to go through, um, you know, once you've decided I'm going to apply for, say, deer and elk, you're going to go to the deer and elk sections in that booklet and look through the units. What's nice now is that all of these codes are broken down by unit, so you can look and see all the hunts that are available for that specific unit. Um, if you are not a youth hunter, you will not be able to select a youth code. So know that 
Um, also, if you do not qualify for mobility impaired or military, um, you won't, those codes won't be available to you either. So make sure that you are selecting the, the right codes um, before you get to the application screen. But learning how to read these is really important. So like with this unit 5A and the elk licenses, you can see that there's, there's bow hunts, that any legal hunts are gonna be any legal weapon. So most people use a rifle for those hunts. Then you're gonna see these ones that say New Mexico resident only. And if I, if I go over to the right-hand side of that row, it has an A on there, which stands for antlerless tells me it's mostly going to be a cow elk hunt, but it's most it's an antlerless elk. So if for some reason a male did not have antlers um, and you shot it, it, it is covered in there. But um, the MB stands for mature bull. The either sex or ES stands for either sex. Um, so all of these abbreviations are in the back of the information booklet under the glossary. And you can kind of decipher what they mean, but um, it, it's worth noting of knowing which ones you're going to apply for. Mature bull tags have a lot more people that apply for them than say the antlerless tags. So that's also something else to consider. Do I just want to go out and shoot an elk and put some meat in the freezer? Or do I really want to go on a big bull hunt? Um, those are the kind of things that you start thinking about as you're picking out these units. Um, then also, yeah, she just circled this HD under 5B uh, unit. That means high demand hunt, which means that there is a lot of people that apply for that hunt. There's only 87 licenses that are available in that hunt. You can see the hunt dates that are there. Um, high demand just means that there's a high demand. Um, there's a lot of people that apply for them. Standard um, has a, a price break, I think, only for the non-residents. Um, but there isn't maybe it maybe isn't as popular as some of those quality high demand hunts. So uh, it's just good to know how to read this as you're starting to look through it. Um, and then you'll notice these hunt codes is right in the middle of, of these sections. It says ELK-2-107 or whatever that code might be that you're going to be selecting. That's the code that you're going to be selecting as we will show you um, on the application screen. Um, if you make an error, we'll, which we'll kind of show you um, how that can happen too. Um, the ELK-1 means it's an any legal weapon. ELK-2 is archery. ELK-3 is muzzleloader. So it does give a code for sort of weapon type. Um, that is, a, if you can't find your code for whatever reason, it may be because you selected the wrong weapon type. So we'll kind of show you how to do those too. But that's why it's important to make note of the right codes. I make lots of notes in my rule and information booklet, not just for me, but for everybody else in my family that's applying so that we know who's applying for what. And the other thing too on this page before we move on is you'll see at the very, um, with the 6B, it says quality high demand. So those ones again um, are gonna be harder to draw. So that's the other point to, if you guys are just kind of wanting to go out and have an opportunity or if you really actually want to harvest something or harvest a big deer or a big elk that quality uh, next to it is probably going to yield you know higher um, trophy or um, mature animals um, for that particular hunt so if all you really care about and these ones are either sex but um, your chances of probably getting something is going to be a whole lot greater because it's a higher quality unit but it just know that the draw odds, it's going to be harder to draw because there's only 25 tags and there's probably a lot of people applying. So um, there is a, a draw odds um, place on the website that we can kind of barely touch on if we have some time, but it will help you understand that, hey, I really, I want to, I really just want an opportunity to hunt a cow elk. And so those draw odds might give you a, a little bit of some pointers of, of where to possibly go. Um, if you want that experience and you don't really care about, you know, a, a mature trophy animal. So, okay. So I think we covered everything pretty much on this particular slide. 
Yeah, do we want to jump into I think I think actually we, doing an application? Yeah, so we already colored. Um so yeah, we can we can do that part when we come back. Absolutely. I just need to get so that, that's always kind of the fun part of you know starting to look at all these as she's getting us pulled up. I'll I'll tell you it's a fun part of you know getting prepared for this is looking at the different hunts that are available, where they are, when they are, the different weapon types, um, what you might want to do with your family, what you might want to do by yourself, um, kind of coming up with a game plan or a strategy that's going to be best for you. Um, and, you know, trying to find some strategy in trying to draw a tag. There's, there's a lot of different um, methods and theories out there um, to increase draw odds. And um, if you're a numbers junkie, then we can certainly dive into some of that later too. But uh, it certainly helps when you can, it makes the excitement happen too as you're starting to put in for these. And um, if you have been applying for years and not drawing anything, um, I'm going to be the bearer of bad news is that it's time to change your draw application strategy. Um, obviously, it hasn't been working. You need to tweak something uh, to increase your ability to, to maybe draw a tag. So this is essentially it. Once you log into your customer account, the landing page that you're going to see, it'll be what well, will be home. So it'll be your information and profile. This is just a test customer. Um, and over here under the main menu, you're going to click on draw hunt applications and then this is your landing page that you'll see right here um and so it'll give you some information up here about whether you want a paper tag or uh, like the paper with the carcass tag or if you would prefer to do the e-tagging options please know that if you click on the e-tag option for your tags you cannot go back to paper so um just know that you're gonna commit <laughs> at that point. So if you're the paper person and you like to pull the sticker off and, and put it on your animal, then go with paper. If you're okay with tagging this way, which I have done a couple of times and it's super easy. So don't let it intimidate yourself uh, on that. But the e-tag is really, really easy too. Um, and it's always on the app on your phone once you draw. So. Either way, just decide that now because you will have to commit to that e-tag if you select that. Um, so you come down here because draw two, that's the only one available right now. Uh, and then you're gonna click on apply now. And this is where if you're creating your own application, you select create new application. Um, we can go into it later on about attaching to existing applications because I think Colleen, you can correct me if I'm wrong or Tristan or Megan, we've had a lot of ladies ask about, holy man, how do I, how do I go about attaching to somebody and I don't want to mess it up. So it's really not too difficult, but there is some information that you will need to obtain from the original applicant to uh, do that. So, but I'm just going to say create. Yeah, on, on that note, if you um, do plan to attach with a friend or family member, somebody will need to do this step first of create application. That has to be done first in order to generate the attach code and the application number. So we'll show you what those look like as we go through the steps, but somebody from your hunting party will need to do this step right here first that Jennifer's working on. Yeah, and please just know too, um, I realized that the test customer is a non-resident, so the license fees are going to be a little bit different, but don't pay attention to the numbers on this, okay? It's only the process, <laughs> um, so don't get confused with, with the numbers. Um, so everybody needs uh, your basic game hunting license to apply and to, to buy your deer or elk or whatever license also. So um, if you're a non-resident, you also can obtain a non-resident game hunting uh, license or a junior game hunting license, um, but you can't buy the combo for non-residents. But for residents, you can do your game hunting. Um, it's, and, and because it's a non-resident, it's not allowing me to do the game hunting and fishing license combo. But if you also plan on fishing this year, residents, you do have the option of, of combining both licenses into one purchase. And that's what I normally do. Um, that way, if somebody says, hey, let's go fishing this weekend, 
I've got my license and I'm ready to go. And it's just so much easier. So I'm gonna click that add to order. Um, then um, this habitat management access validation, it's a $4 stamp. It's it, you have to have it. So that's why you get, like, can't click on it. It's just added to your license. Then if you wanna hunt migratory birds, I always click it because I never know if I'm gonna go hunt doves. So I just go ahead and throw it in the pot. And then um, your habitat stamp, um, that's if you're gonna be hunting on forest service or um, BLM properties and yeah. And so you need, you have essentially all, most of our public land are those. So you just, just have it, just go ahead and click it. Um, you can, this is popping up because I clicked that I wanted to hunt migratory birds. And so you, you know, this is asking, this is the feds asking a survey um, for information. Um, so you can fill it in if you want or not. So just submit for now. Oh, I have to, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot. Ah, not none, sorry. If you, yeah, if you didn't hunt or you didn't have a hip stamp last year, you can just select didn't hunt, so. Yeah. And then but this well, gives uh, some good information to the, the feds, like Jen said. So we appreciate you guys submitting it. Yeah. So this is my game hunting with all of my stamps and everything. It's giving me the total. I'm just going to click add to cart or let's say, oops, no, I forgot something. You could go back and, and fix it. So you can always fix something until the very end when you put in your um, credit card information. So this is again, reminding you of the, the deadline. Um, now we're gonna go to species. So we'll just, since a lot of folks have asked about elk, we're gonna go ahead and jump right into the elk. And if you plan to apply for multiple species, you're gonna need to do this process each time for each species. Um, make sure to add it to cart when you're done, and then you can check out in one transaction at the end, but you'll need to go and apply for each species separately. Hey, Colleen, I think now's a good time to mention that um, you don't have to buy a game hunting license for every species. Once you buy it, right. you can buy it once. So if that part is only one time after that, um, you won't have to keep buying it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You'll just have to buy the one. It is good for the entire year. Um, if you do not draw any of these big game licenses, that still enables you to um, be able to go hunting for um, birds or um, coyotes, um, anything like that is still gives you an opportunity. Upland game, small game, you can still go out and hunt um, those species that fall under a general hunting license. Good point, Megan. So here's where you're gonna select uh, any legal weapon type. Um, and then again, this is where this uh, comes in handy dandy. And so, of course, if you haven't checked things off here, this can be mind boggling. <laughs> so <laughs> click on here and then you can go to um, your, your hunt code here. Or if you know exactly what unit you want to apply for, um, if you know that you just want 16B, then, then that, that it, it does provide everything to you. But again, I always do this and cross check it with the drop down box. So um, our first choice is gonna be mature bull um, unit 16B. I'm gonna select that one. Then I'm gonna go to my second choice. And I'm gonna go here and I thought, and uh, you know, maybe I want a, a hunt on the, the caldera as my second choice. So I'll hey, select Jen. that one. Jen, can you increase the, the width of the page? Um, and see, it's a little bit hard to read on my end. So it's as big as my laptop monitor will allow. <laughs> Worth a try. <laughs> yeah. Unless some uh, techie guru knows how I can zoom in on my page on my laptop. Because then I'll learn something new too, but I don't know how to make actually my image bigger. 
Hey, Jennifer, this is Brittany. If you go ahead and click control and then okay. like the plus button, like if it's like your, your volume, that might work. <gasps> you are awesome. Perfect. Is that better? <gasps> yes. Perfect. Just learn something new. Good job, Britt. I love that. Okay. Thank you. Know. You bet. Brittany saved the day. Okay. So hopefully that is better <laughs> and it's not microscopic. Um, now we're going to go to our second choice. We'll still stick with any legal method. Um, and then maybe you're thinking about, um, I think some folks were talking about the Hamus. So we'll just stick to the Hamus with 16A. And then here's that fourth choice anomaly here. Um, if you don't want to have a fourth choice, don't click anything. Because <laughs> um, this is more of those, hey, this is some leftover opportunities um, and a depredation and stuff like that. So if you don't want anything like that, then um, don't do anything uh, on this. The next one is that fifth choice, or this is what the population management hunts. So you might get a phone call or an email saying, hey, um, we've got a, a depredation problem on so-and-so's property and we need to pull a few hunters. And if you say yes, then you could be included in that pool. It can open up opportunities, but nothing is guaranteed. And it can also be kind of not really last minute, but if you think two weeks is last minute, then that could be not a good thing for you. So anybody else want to add to, to that conversation? I do. Um, so those fourth and fifth choices require um, you to make a selection. That's why there's the little red stars on them. Otherwise you will get this big fat error on the top of the page and sometimes people miss it and they can't understand what they're doing wrong that won't let them add the hunt. Um, so make sure that you do put something down for those. Um, I have a lot of people too that say, well, I have three choices, but do I have to put in all three? No, you can just put in one choice if you wanted, but just realize that is the only hunt you are putting in for. If you want to increase your odds of drawing an elk tag, we give you three opportunities to select hunts to do so. So it's not required for you to select all three, but it is encouraged. So um, that's just kind of the two cents on that. And then this next section, um, since we have a, a couple non-residents, even for the residents, this section here is asking if this is an outfitted hunt. This means that you would be applying in the outfitter pool, in that 10% pool. Um, you do have to have a signed contract in place prior to that. Jen, if you'll click yes on that, I want to show them what pops up. So again, residents or non-residents could apply in this pool. You have to have that contract in place, and then you would have to have their um, outfitter number. They will give you that number at the time of application, or some outfitters even help you with this process and do it for you. Um, you have to enter in their outfitter number. Then uh, once you submit your application, it is audited in our system to ensure that number one, that's a legit number. Number two, that is a registered outfitter um, and that your application is valid to be in that pool. Um, a lot of people ask, oh my gosh, why would I give up 84% draw or 84% of my pool to be in the 10% pool. Well, it's part of playing the draw odds. Sometimes your odds are better in the outfitter pool than they are in uh, the non-resident pool because there's so many residents applying, but not as many people applying in the outfitter pool. So just kind of depends on how you want to play the numbers game there. But if you are not hunting with an outfitter, you'll click no. And then, um, It'll scroll down and ask you to verify your info. And Jen made a really good point about eTag earlier. And so Jen, I'll let you talk about this spot. Okay, so this is where I was saying, if you don't want the paper, um, you don't want to worry about, oh, if I have the paper, I'm going to lose it or it's going to get destroyed or I'll forget it. Um, this eTag option is good for you. But just know when you click, when you click on this, you are going to be committed to that e-tag option. Um, let's say that you opted for a carcass tag and 
for whatever reason you changed your mind, you can change your mind and go from e-tag to paper. You just cannot do it the other way around. So for this, this we will just say, we're just gonna go with the paper carcass tag because um, Jennifer's old school. Um, and then you have to click this button that you have reviewed this and you know what your options are and you have selected what you want in the end if you're successful. And then you're gonna go here to add cart. And what's really nice is at any time, if you wanna go back, you can go back. So just know that. I'm gonna add that to cart. And it's showing my stuff up here. Um, I've got my elk and my game hunting license. So that's what this no number is corresponding to. So now if I want to apply for something else, I'm going to apply for another species and I would click that and go through that same process again. Um, this is where maybe you wanted to attach with somebody else um, or somebody else wanted to attach to you. Um, so you're going to click on attach to an existing application. Um, this is, I don't have this information, so I apologize, but you're going to obtain that other person's application number and attach code. And this is sent to those people who've already applied. And then they send that information to you. And there's, what's really nice is it gives you more information here on how to go about doing this. Um, but each person has to have their own customer account. And if you're attaching to somebody else, they already have had to have applied. So that is the key factor there. Or if you're the primary applicant and somebody is attaching to you, you need to go through the whole process first to get your application number and your attach code. And then you send it to the people who are wanting to apply with you. So that's that's really important right there. And then of course it will have all of the same information again. And if you're wondering why you should even use that option, um, the biggest benefit to attaching to an application is to ensure that if you draw, whoever else on your application also draws. So you can do up to, I believe three people on an application. Um, and like I said, the, the biggest benefit is that all of you draw, but that could also mean that none of you draw. So as I mentioned earlier with that random application um, draw, if you are late in the sequence of drawing the applications um, and they get to you and say you and three or two other people I've applied for deer and there's only one deer tag left for that specific hunt code, nobody gets it. It moves on to the next application or the next hunt code. So you have to make sure that if you're gonna be putting in for hunts if attached to people, you're putting in that have sufficient amount of tags available. Um, and that also can be said for residents and non-residents. We have a lot of people that um, might be a resident here and they want to attach with their brother-in-law from Oklahoma. And they think that it in increases their draw odd by putting their brother on their brother-in-law on their application, thinking it puts them in the resident pool and it does not. Um, there would have to be a non-resident um, license available for that hunt code uh, once your application was pulled. There might be say 30 resident licenses left but if there is zero non-resident left, none of you draw. So it can be a hindrance to non-residents um, and to residents to apply together. So just kind of a piece of advice there. Um, and to give you an example, my husband and I hunt together every single year. We have never in the 13 years that we have been together applied together <laughs> because we wanna increase our odds kind of separately. Uh, to be able to go. So um, regardless, we know we're going with each other um, and somebody's going to get to hunt. We're just happy to kind of tag along. So just to kind of give you an idea on that. Yep. And if you are going to be attacked and, and, and we do the same kind of thing <laughs> on our end is we, we apply separately. Um, but at the same time, we have made a mistake sometimes of applying separately and then forgetting about um, 
well, dang it, now we have two hunts going on at the same time. So who gets to go or how many days do we get to go here and, and over here? And hopefully they're not in two opposite spectrums of the state. Um, so just be aware of that too, um, yeah. making sure you hey. don't overbook yourself. <laughs> hey, Jennifer, I would say though, on the flip side, if your partner that applied with you is higher up in the sequence and they get pulled, you get pulled. Yeah. So yeah. you have to look at, you have to kind of weigh like, okay, yeah, there may not be enough tags for all of us if we're, I'm low on the sequence, but if my buddy, if, if their number gets pulled higher up, I tag along with them and I could have been way down here and granted you won't know any of that, but that's just something right. to think about too. When you apply with each other is if one gets pulled, you all follow if there's enough of them. So yeah, absolutely. You just you just never know how that's going to pan out. It's just like flipping a coin. You just never know. But there are, you know, you just never know. Um, just real quick, I wanted I clicked on Bighorn Sheep because we actually had a couple people come in the office this week and ask this question about Bighorn Sheep. Is you know I went in there and I applied for all Rocky Mountain and it wouldn't let me apply for desert. <laughs> it's like no, you don't get to apply six times for sheep. It's, Bighorn sheep, and then you have to determine if you want to hunt all Rockies or if you want to split your chances up between Rocky and uh, desert, or do you just want opportunity to hunt sheep and you just want to hunt ewes. So just keep that in mind. Um, of course, putting in for bighorn sheep, um, it's tough to just know that it's probably, a, you know, most of us aren't going to ever get to hunt sheep and that's just kind of how it goes. But um, you'll go through the same process of, of, of all of, of choosing where you want to go and what hunt codes, et cetera. And um, with, with the bighorn sheep, you'll notice that, um, you know, we've got all of our Rockies um, and then so these are all of our Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep populations. You'll click on, uh, on a hunt code and then you'll just follow these prompts to make your choices. Um, because this particular hunt code is for Rocky Mountain only, then I will go through here and click all of, all of those hunt codes that are with that particular bighorn sheep species for that date and then these are the areas in which I want to hunt. So it's a little bit more complex, but just know that you don't apply two different ways for the two different bighorn sheep species. And of course, if that's all you want to put for bighorn sheep, um, and then of course, absolutely, I want, <laughs> I want to be on population management because I want to hunt sheep. So make sure you select that one as well. Look. Let me add to that, Jen, because sheep is definitely a, one of the most different and maybe slightly more complicated applications. So yes. if you'll go to second choice and then select deserts. So when you do your application, you can apply for Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep. And then your, your second hunt code could be the desert Bighorn Sheep. So you can still apply for both species, but you... For each species, you get three choices. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of break those up and how you want to do them. Um, then and it's even not, as a third choice, oh. you, can, you can put use if you wanted to apply for bighorn use, which is only Rocky Mountain bighorn use um, in certain units. Um, but both RAM licenses, whether it's a Rocky or a desert, are once in a lifetime draws. So if you draw that tag, say you draw the Rocky tag, you cannot apply for Rocky next year. So it wouldn't even give you the option when you come in next year to apply for Rockies because you, you've already drawn that tag before. So you can only apply for deserts. So that's the situations where you can have, you know, limited options on, on what is provided for you because you may have drawn previous tags. So um, I just wanted to kind of, those are all the U ones, but. <clears throat> yep, thank you, Colleen. And then um, again, because we're applying for another species, you still have to select this one. So no, make sure your information is, is good to go. I reviewed that I'm also going to get 
um, a paper tag. And that's what's nice too, maybe on your bighorn sheep, if, if you draw, then you can get an e-tag. Um, so you can split that up, but it's so much easier just to keep everything all in one basket. So I'm gonna add to cart. Um, so let's say I'm all done. I don't wanna add any more or apply for any more species. So you're gonna come up here to your shopping cart. So it's just like Amazon, you're gonna to go to your cart and you're gonna review, make sure, <laughs> this is where people make mistakes. Make sure everything that you have highlighted in your little book or wherever you keep your notes matches to what you selected on the screen. Because as you can see on the drop down, it's real easy to think you click on something and you don't. And that's where some of those common mistakes are made. So just double check, double check your, your work here. Um, and you can always edit or let's say, oh man, that's way more money than I have budget for if that even gets to happen. So I'm gonna just have to delete this because my credit card isn't gonna handle that kind of transaction. So just make sure that um, you're all good here with everything. Um, if you have an opportunity and you would like to make a donation to Operation Game Thief or Share with Wildlife, you have an option to do that here. If you wanna learn more about it, you can click there. But if you're all good to go, you're not gonna apply for anything else, you're gonna go ahead and proceed to the checkout screen. Again, you can uh, look things over and if you're like, yeah, I don't know if that's right or not, you can go back, um, but you need to click this button. This is also confirming my residency status right here. So it goes over what Megan had uh, covered earlier. I'm affirming, um, well, with this particular individual, I'm claiming that I'm a non-resident. I'm going to play pay by credit card. I've got my name here, my account number. Um, I'm gonna put in my card. Oh, that's a lot of one. Okay. Bear with me here. There's lots of ones on this thing. Should be 15 of them. Okay, thank you. I'm like, this is just scrolling on forever. Fifteen ones or 15 total numbers, right? 15 ones, 16 total numbers since you started with a visa. Shoot, I had to do math. My brain hurts. <laughs> uh, okay. And if you guys decide that, um, you know, you want to apply for other things, but you can only have a certain budget for, you know, this pay period, you could always come back in and add other species later. Just because you're not adding more species right now in this transaction, does it mean that that's the only chance that you get to do your application? You can come back later. Um, you have four weeks uh, from tomorrow to do it. So um, it's going to go by kind of fast. But a lot of people like to do that their application so that they're not tying up um, a lot of money at once. So for residents, if we applied for everything, um, I think it's like $860 for everything. So, you know, it, it's kind of hard to tie up that money, but again, if you don't draw some of that, it does come back um, and get refunded. Okay, so I didn't like my number here, so. Okay. And that's all matching. It doesn't like any of these credit card numbers, but essentially, <laughs> Essentially, oh, wait, there went. Um, oh there, there we went. go. Yep. It was thinking. It's like, has yep. she maxed it out yet? <laughs> <laughs> I still had dollars left. So I still had credit on my credit card. <laughs> Perfect. I probably maxed it out now. So I'm um, going to show you your license year. Again, it goes over what you applied for. Um, you can view your receipts on all of this. You can print it off. Um, if you want paper copy or it all just lives here in your profile and you can always come back to your profile and view it 
And up until the application deadline, you can always go in and, and edit. The other thing though, that I think we need to cover is if you go in and edit and you've already paid for something that's in there and you want to edit it or take things away, just know you will not be refunded right away. You will be refunded after the draw application or after the draw has happened um, right around that window. So just know that once you've already paid, you're locked into whatever those license fees were uh, until the refund occurs later on down the road. It's not instantaneous. So a lot of people think that, oh man, I, I overspent and uh, I didn't really wanna do that. Well, you're gonna have to wait until the refunds um, hit. Uh, so but that's you, how all that works. If, if you did find an error for some reason, we've had a couple people come into the office or call us and say, I don't know how it happened, but somehow I selected the wrong code and I already paid for it and I didn't notice it till I got to this page. Um, you could cancel that application and redo it, but like Jen said, it's gonna take a minute for that refund to come through. Um, and your draw results will still show pending on here until the draw results come out. This is the page everyone likes to go to and check and see if something came out early, but make sure that it's there. Um, You'll also see under special hunt drawing applications there in the middle of the screen, there's the application number and attach code. So if you're going to be attaching with somebody, those are the two pieces of information that they will need to attach to your application or that you would get from them. I highly do not recommend you to do that on Bighorn Sheep, but um, you, could, you can do it on Elk. Um, and you, you, each one of those codes is going to be unique and specific to your application. Yeah, good deal. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, is there anything else, ladies, on this page that, or in this process that we need to cover, or have there been any questions that we need to address in regards to this process? Um, I haven't seen any questions come through, but the, the one thing I would add is I've, I've heard a lot of rumors lately that um, there's recommendations going around that on your three hunt choices, that if you really want a unit, you apply for the same unit. And as Colleen explained earlier, the way that our DOS system works with sequencing applications, that essentially is not a good idea because <laughs> um, uh, you're really limiting your choices. Uh, and, and so I would definitely look at three different options for your hunt choices. And if you don't remember exactly what Colleen said, there's a, a page in the rules and information booklet and on our website that helps outline how that job process works. So make sure, make sure and check that out. Yep, and it's it's also right there on the login page too, as you're doing your hunts, it gives kind of a description of how that gets broken out. Um, so a couple other things maybe to consider as you're preparing for what hunts to put in for. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip the top one and go over these other ones first, because then we'll go back to draw odds. But draw odds are a very important aspect of this. Um, think about your schedules, your family schedules, anybody who might be applying with you and what their schedules might be, because are you also maybe applying in other states? Are you going to be applying for hunts that overlap each other? Or maybe you've booked a whitetail hunt in Kansas that's the same time as the rut hunt for mule deer in New Mexico. Um, it's just kind of good to look at those and make sure that you're not doubling yourself. Um, there are lots of other opportunities in other states. So, you know, I always encourage you guys to look at those two if you're, if you're trying to expand some horizons, but New Mexico is an absolutely amazing place to apply for because of the random draw, because of the extensive hunting seasons that we have and all the different species that we have to hunt here. So um, you definitely want to take advantage of that. Um, if you're just getting into hunting and you're just taking the baby steps, might be a good idea to kind of look at a five-year plan or if you've already got a couple animals under your belt and you want to kind of branch some of those horizons and try some new things and go in some different areas, some different units that you may not have gotten time for, plan for those. Um, you know, maybe set a goal of, you know, I'm going to apply for deer and elk this year. Next year might be deer, elk, and oryx. Um, you can kind of start to plan that and it helps you to plan financially for that or if you only have so much time available to take off for vacation for work or you've got other vacations scheduled, you want to make sure that you're, um, you know, leaving yourself enough time and grace to, 
to maybe make some of those hunts fit. Um, do you have support during your hunt? Are you, is somebody going to be helping you either on your hunt or are they going to be taking care of things at home for you? Uh, what kind of resources do you have available? Uh, do you need to get new gear? Looking at the full scope of things and probably in the next coming uh, ladies hours, we're going to be kind of talking about what about after the draw? We've, we've gotten our draw results. Now what? How do we start planning for that? And so stay tuned for some of those future ones because we'll give you a lot more information of, okay, now you've drawn the tag. This is what, what you need to start working on. Um, and it's always good, you know, within your maybe five-year plan, but annual plan too is what happens if I don't draw any tags? Heaven forbid, knock on wood. Um, do I have something else that I can maybe line up? New Mexico has a lot of over-the-counter opportunities as well. So you can certainly look into some of those hunts and getting something scheduled. Um, New Mexico is one of the first Western states um, as far as draw deadlines. So if you apply in New Mexico and you find out your draw results, there might be some other states that still have time for you to apply in their draw uh, for a backup plan. If you want to go to Arizona, Texas, um, think of other places that are later, I think Idaho, Wyoming. So Colorado those are some other options for you too. Colorado, yeah. Depends on species and it depends on states. But um, the biggest thing, at least for me, that I like to consider is what I already know I'm going to be applying for everything. Um, just because I want to increase my odds and I want a chance to go after anything this wonderful state will let me get a tag for. Um, but I also like to build in some strategy in there too of what kind of weapon I'm going to be using and what are the draw odds. Am I going to be applying for hunts that are just opportunity hunts or am I going to want a high quality uh, demand hunt that is uh, considered a trophy hunt or a very unique opportunity based off of the limited tag numbers, maybe the location, like Vias Caldera. Um, you know, those are also once in a lifetime hunts there. So it just kind of depends on what I feel like going on an adventure on this year. Um, then I take a look at the draw odds. Do I see how big of a gamble am I gonna make applying for this tag? And am I good with not drawing it because I am risking putting a lot towards a high quality um, hunt or one that has a lot of draws. So to find that, I'm gonna pull up um, a screen here and see if I can bump out of this for a second to show you how to find this information because we do have, a, have it available on our Department of Game and Fish website. And so I wanna show you guys where that is. Okay. A thumbs up if you can see that screen, Jim. Good. Awesome. All right, so you're going to go to our Department of Game and Fish website. You're going to see this hunting um, tab and drop down. And then I am going to go to Big Game and Draw Hunts. And the third one over is Draw Info, Odds, and Success Tips. So we put all of this information on our website so you can see how many people applied for every hunt code how it was drawn and distributed. And it is very useful and for one of you. It could be a very overwhelming tool also. So we're not gonna get into the weeds of it tonight, but I'm gonna show you at least where it is and what to look for and how to read the report. because there's a lot of numbers on here. So this tab just kind of shows you how our draw works, which we already kind of went over, but if you wanna read it again and maybe get a, another interpretation of it, um, this is a description of how Draw New Mexico works. Then I'm going to click on odds and reports. And this first one here is a 2021 big game drawing odds complete report. This is going to open an Excel file, which hopefully I'll be able to open. Let me just keep you on that. Sure. Can you see it, Jen? No, it was down at the bottom of the screen for you to click okay. on, but it went away. Yeah, let me let me reshare. How about now? Mm, yes. Okay. So it opens up this Excel list and it breaks it down by species um, and by hunt code. 
So on the left-hand side, you can see the species that's there. It starts with antelope. It's gonna give the unit description um, and it breaks this down um, by pre-hunt application. So that's how many people applied. And then off to the right is gonna be the distribution of how those tags were allocated, okay? So we're gonna, let's see, let's pick, cause it's such a popular one. Unit 16 antelope hunt. Um, people come from across the world to hunt unit 16 for antelope. It's very, very well known. It is a high demand hunt. And you can see that by the amount of applicants that have applied for that. So I have the hunt code here. It tells me what the unit is, which is unit 16. It tells me there's only 10 licenses available for that hunt code. Then it tells me um, how many people put that as their first choice. It's over a thousand. Let's see if I can make that bigger for you guys. Is that better? Um, over a thousand people put that as their first choice, 458 put it as their second choice, and 366 put it for their third choice. You can also see majority of those were residents. Um, and then we had a, some amount that applied in the non-resident pool, and then quite a few in the outfitter pool, 203 put it as their first choice in the outfitter pool. But then looking at the distribution of that, so there is our 10 licenses. Nine of those licenses were given to somebody who had their application pulled with that being their first choice. So what I like to do is I like to come in here and look at that distribution because then it tells me what hunts I need to put in what order. Um, I can go in and put in all the ones that I want, but I am more than likely, my strategy is more than likely gonna be, I'm gonna put in the hunts that have the hardest draw odds first, the least amount of tags first, because I want first crack at that smaller amount of tags. Then I can leave my third choice as either, um, a really good hunt that might have more tags, or maybe it's an opportunity hunt that has a lot of tags. Um, and then I can kind of calculate my draw odds from there. There is a lot of um, companies out there too that uh, will help you with this kind of information if you want somebody to help consult you with that. But um, this gives you a lot of information in this report that you can kind of look through um, and decipher what that looks like. So also going across here, you can see with the resident um, columns, eight put it in, eight residents drew it on their first choice. So that's kind of what it tells me. Obviously, if there's that many people applying it on their first choice, I'm not going to put it as my third choice because nobody drew it as their third choice. If that makes sense. Um, so Antelope is all here. You can look through all the different hunt codes, just to barber sheet, big sheet. And so we talked about how it's a lifetime tag and a lot of people, it's a very coveted tag and the draw odds are not great. This is why Bighorn 201, this is the Rocky Mountain Bighorn sheep tags. Over 7,000 people applied for their first choice and over 4,000 for their second choice. We have a lot of people wanting to come hunt sheep here in New Mexico, but there's only 26 licenses available in the entire state for Rocky Mountain Bighorn Rams. Um, these uh, the 202 and 203 are the U tags, and then 204 is the desert sheep hunt. So you can see 5,000 and 4,000 in those as well. So the odds are not great, but um, there's still a chance. That's what we're trying to tell you. <laughs> you won't you won't draw if you don't apply. Absolutely. And because it's once in a lifetime, um, you know, you definitely want to at least have an opportunity at it. And because New Mexico does not have a point system, it means that you can put in for it every single year and have a chance at it every single year and not have to wait to build 25 or 35 points in a state before you even have a chance at drawing that tag. So We've got a good system here uh, when it comes to stuff like that. So um, deer are also here. You know, every species is going to be on here. So uh, I just kind of wanted to give you the rundown of those. But um, this report is really, really helpful 
when it comes to making your selections and in what order you decide to do them. So um, that's just a little bit on draw odds. I will stop share. There we go. I know that was a lot of information to absorb. <laughs> so at any time, um, maybe as you guys sit down and you're applying, if you have that report up and you have questions, um, our contact information will be on the slide here in just a minute. And don't hesitate to call us and say, am I reading this right? Am I understanding this right? And by all means, please don't hesitate to reach out to us because it can be a little uh, overwhelming looking at all those numbers and getting your decoder ring out to try to figure out what the heck it's trying to tell you. So awesome. Absolutely. Always reach out to us. Yeah. Um, one of the things, too, I just want to backtrack on just slightly is your backup plans if you don't draw. Um, we've had a few folks ask us, well, especially for youth, if your youth is unsuccessful in the draw, there are applications for residents um, that are called uh, youth encouragement hunts um, that are available if they're unsuccessful in, in the draw, too. But uh, if you don't, if they don't apply, in that in that draw, then they're don't they're, and obviously they're not going to be unsuccessful, so then they're not eligible for those youth encouragement hunts. So just know that the, the the youth has to initially apply. They initially have to be unsuccessful species wide. It's not just hey my my child drew for deer, but we're unsuccessful in elk. So how come they're not able to put it? Well, because that youth actually pulled a tag. So if a youth is completely across the board, unsuccessful in drawing a tag, then they're eligible residents for youth encouragement hunts that will be available later on. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, also, oh, Colleen, was that good on that slide? Yes, oh, yeah. Um, any questions that have come up since we blasted them with the data? <laughs> I know that was a ton of info, you guys. And um, is everybody that, just mind blown that you're just like, what? <laughs> that was the short version too. So like Jen said, we, we have a ton of info. And um, you know, if you have questions, this is your time to ask some of them, or you can always reach out to us um, via email here. Shoot us an email, give us a call at the office. We are so happy to help you guys out. And we want to make sure that you get applied before the deadline which is March 16th at 5 p.m. Mountain Time. Yes, absolutely. Um, so anything that we might have missed moderators um, in the chat or anything else, or if anybody would like to personally ask questions right now, we would love to open the platform up for anything um, at this time. Hey, I, I, this is Bridget. I do have a question. Um, my friend is the one that has the youth from out of state who wants to come hunting here. Because you guys say that the draw quotas for non-residents is only 6%, if we were to apply together, would that mean that it would drop the, like um, us being residents, would it drop our chances as well? Yes, I, I recommend that he applies separately from yours. And then that way, if he does draw, then hopefully you guys could be available to help support him um, when he comes to New Mexico. Um, but if, if his number in sequence is pulled first and everything he's applied for has already been filled, then the rest of you will also be rejected. Um, now, here's the other thing that I wanted to clarify is youth only hunts. Um, obviously an adult cannot apply with a youth on a youth only hunt. And of course the system won't allow you to do that either, but um, just know that adults cannot apply and attach an application number to a youth only hunt. Um, All right, now youth, youth can apply for the general tags as well, but the youth have a better opportunity of drawing for youth only hunts. And I would highly recommend focusing on that first as your first choices. Um, and then maybe some of the other hunts as your third choice um, in the general population hunts that will increase their chances of drawing because they're only allowed to apply for youth hunts up until they turn 17. Um, well, it, it's 
that they have to be under 18 at the time of their hunt. Highly recommend applying them for the youth hunts. Um, and that goes for you know everybody else that's on the call too, whether you're residents or non-residents, apply those youth for the youth hunts because those kind of hunts are at a very specific time and are incredible hunts that all of us adults wish that we could get. So um, take advantage of those while you can. Yeah. Bridget, did that answer your questions? Yes, it did. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And of course, when they get to the point too of actually applying and they still need some assistance, please have them call. Another great resource uh, is to call our information uh, center. If you're just totally mind boggled about how to even set up a customer account and or apply, uh, they are there to assist you over the phone, but you still need to have all of this information, your hunt codes um, up front. So your call can be quick and, and effective with them so you can get on and off and be done. But there is also assistance available through our call center if for some reason um, we're not available to help you guys. And Tristana, could you clarify, is the call center going to have extended hours again this year? Or is it okay? Yes. Um, they will be open from 8 to 6 the week before the draw and then 8 to 8 on uh, Monday and Tuesday, March 14th and 15th. Okay, super. And Jen, there was a question in the chat about hunter safety courses. When, where, online, in person? I think you are the right person to answer that one. All of the above, Megan and I can feel that very <laughs> easily. Um, so we are offering in-person courses. Um, we're already into February and our March class is already filling up. So just um, you can access um, our statewide class listing for in-person courses off the Hunter Ed landing page on the main Game and Fish website. Um, just click on the course schedule um, and scroll down and it will give you the county on the main website, give you the county, the type of course, the dates and when registration opens. And I am telling you right now, registration, when it opens at nine o'clock, it's starting to become like a fire sale for these spots because we're limited due to COVID. So courses or areas where we would have had 30 or 40 slots, it's almost in half because we have to accommodate for the health orders. So just know our slots are filling very, very quickly. Um, for those of you who have family members, kiddos yourself who are 10 and over, um, I recommend going ahead and having them take an online course. Um, it's gonna get even worse. Um, if you can get into an in-person course, that's awesome. But just know your options have increased if your kids are 10 and over because we have three online hunter ed options. You can start those at any time. You access those off the main Game and Fish website as well. Um, the online courses are uh, self-paced. So they can log in and out as much as they want if they've got sports and school and other stuff going on. Um, and then if you're very... Um, just adamant or that you would really prefer for them to have that in-person component as well, you can always sign up for a hunter education course after the deadline so they can get those hands-on skills. And so just know that if you're getting pressed for time and you just have not been able to get into an in-person course, have them take the online and then have them come back and see us um, and, and go through the course to get those hands-on skills if, if you feel like they would get it if they need that or would benefit hearing from somebody else as well. Cause I know sometimes as parents or even spouses, it's easier to hear from somebody else than those that are super close to you. So um, those are some options um, that are available uh, as well. So but our, our in-person courses are, are getting filled very fast and you register for those through the customer account system. So just know that those youth need to have their own customer account. And then when you find a date or a location or time that works for you, you'll register them when, uh, on that specific day uh, in their CIN account. Jennifer, just to add, um, so in New Mexico, anyone under the age of 18 has to have hunter education to get a license, to apply. Um, it won't let you, the system will not allow you to even purchase the game hunting license if you don't have a hunter number in your customer account. Now, I know we have someone on here that's talking about uh, the, the non-resident. If they've taken Hunter Ed in another state, we'll accept that. When you're creating their customer account, it's just going to ask you where's their Hunter Ed number and from what state, and you would input it there. Um, so make sure for uh, 
for I know who we had one on here that uh, is going to bring a, someone from California, I think. Um, we'll accept California's. Right. They just have to have it before they can even do any kind of application or purchases. Thanks, Megan. Awesome. I bet everybody's getting kind of hungry, <laughs> um, but I don't want to end it before I know we have fielded everybody's questions or if we need to clarify anything that we've covered. I do have a question. Um, the office I'm assuming is only open like eight to five if I wanna pick up a hard copy, correct? Monday through yes. Friday? Okay. Yes, Monday through Friday, eight to five. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. This was so helpful. Oh, good. Thank you so much. We love to hear that. We love to hear that we're not just uh, muddying the water. <laughs> I know that but was it, a lot of info. <laughs> yes, it was. And there was a couple of you that um, did not have a customer account created. And so I just um, put a link in the chat, which is online sales.wildlife.state.nm.us. And it's the same login site if you do have an account, but there will be an option on there that says create account. And it'll walk you through the prompts to get that set up and create your customer um, identification number and create your online portal. And if you guys are confused about how that how to do that process, just give us a call and we'll help be happy to help walk you through the process over the phone. And we'll sit there and, and help help you through that process for sure. But it's very, it's pretty simple and self-explanatory once you get into it. It's just like creating an account like we do for anything else. So awesome. Great. Well, thank you, ladies, so much for uh, allowing us to bombard your brains with so much information, but it is very useful. And um, I, I really appreciate Colleen taking the extra time to talk about the draw odds because that is a very helpful tool that I think it's overlooked or, you know, so it is available that, um, but if some of you are just like, you know what, I'm just gonna throw my cares to the wind and <laughs> that's okay too. I've done that and been very successful that way too. So you can either strategize about it to death or you can just kind of select what you want and, and you know, flip a coin, but, um, just have fun with it, have fun with the process. And it's always like Christmas when it's like, oh, the draw odds are gonna be available. It's so exciting. And so I hope everybody gets to experience that excitement. And then of course, there's always that letdown sometimes too. But um, one of the things I also kind of want that I forgot to add um, earlier is for those of you who are very new to hunting and you're just not really too sure where to start and what species to start with, Antelope is always a good species because you can hunt them all day and it doesn't require a lot of equipment. Javelina is another species that even though you do have to hunt them in the colder months, it's a pretty non-invasive, I want to say, type of hunting situation. You can hunt them all day. Um, and so those are just some, some species that are, are super low key um, to get started and, and mule deer is as well. So just to kind of give you a starter on that um, and see where it goes. Well, great. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, Megan, Colleen, Tristana, for um, being the awesome team that you are to help put these on. And want to say good night to everybody. Good luck in applying. Hopefully, we all have some good news come April. Um, and then our next social hour in March, uh, Megan's going to kick it off with Helen. We're going to talk turkey again. Uh, Helen is amazing. And is going to have a very engaging session to talk about spring turkey that's in April. So we hope everybody is here to join us um, on March 22nd. Well, thank you. I had to look at the calendar. March 22nd, be on the lookout for those um, invites, but have a good night and we will see you again. Bye everybody.